This week on Disaffected, excess charity and willful blindness strike again. We'll talk about a Milwaukee family court judge that just got busted for kitty porn. Guess what? He was the director of the city's Drag Queen Story Hour, an educational program for children. Then we're going to introduce you to Carrie Smith, co-host of the podcast, Unsafe Space. Like me, Carrie is a survivor of an abusive borderline mother, and she woke up to the personality disordered nature of the social justice cult she's now escaped after decades inside. This is the first time Carrie has talked about her experience publicly, and this is an interview that you won't want to miss. Coming up this week on Disaffected. Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum. This is the show where we talk about cluster B personality disorders and abuse dynamics, the things that happen in the home with domestic violence against children and against spouses, and that have spilled out into our public discourse in a way that I think we've never seen before. Um, I've got a couple of things that I want to talk about first, and then we have an interview uh, with somebody I think you're really going to enjoy, Carrie Smith, uh, co-host of the podcast, unsafe space. But I wanted to, a story came across my social media feed today uh, that that made me sick to my stomach, but it also felt very familiar, and it tied into some of the things that we've talked about on this show. So you remember from last week's episode that I talked about the excess charity and the undue benefit of the doubt that too many of us have been giving to people who are abusers, who are narcissists, who are sociopaths, and who are trying to take over our politics, steal resources that don't belong to them, change the curriculum in our schools in ways that inculcate children into the idea, for example, that white people are inherently oppressive, and that anyone who claims they're oppressed is due some sort of social or financial reparations. And this story, this this story is kind of a twofer. It, it's sort of an I told you so, and also an example of what can happen to children when we blind ourselves to predators who are staring us directly in our eyes. So, A Milwaukee judge, family court judge, was just busted for having kitty porn. And lo and behold, this judge was also the director of the city's Drag Queen Story Hour program. Now, if you haven't heard of these before, this has been popular for a couple of the uh, couple of years, both in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, the, there, the, there's there's an, actually an organization here in the U.S. I don't know if this is the exact title, but uh, but it has Drag Queen Story Hour in in uh, in the name, and the idea is that drag performers, men who dress as women. Um, are sort of ambassadors for tolerance and the rainbow queer LGBTQ community um, who are there to teach children about tolerance and acceptance and that love comes in many colors and all these things that sound like unicorns and fairy dust, right? This is a little bit hard for some of us gay men because drag has been part of our subculture for, I mean, it goes back at least all the way to the beginning of the 20th century um, and is certainly still a mainstay of adult nightclub entertainment in the gay world. And when I was a young man, I uh, I did drag sometimes on the weekends for fun or because we were putting on a show at college. Um, but the drag that I knew was a very different drag than what we're seeing today. And because the what we used to call the gay community has been expanded into the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, questioning community. The definition of, of, of what used to be my community has expanded so much. And there are, because, of course, we're all about lowering barriers. We're about being inclusive. When you hear people talk about inclusion and removing barriers to access, these should not make you feel cuddly. They should make you they should make you see a red flag because what this is really about 
is violating boundaries. And when you remove barriers and you remove boundaries, predators know it. When you make your community or your children or your family or your school a place that is all inclusive to everybody, we just love everybody, you're a ripe target. So let me read you a couple of quotes from this story. Feminists have been warning about this. Mothers have been warning about this. And they're all, they've are all they all been written off as conservative, right-wing, Christian nut jobs who hate gay people. And it is absolutely a tragedy. They were right. The gay men like me who have been talking about this were right. And now the chickens are coming home to roost. This is from uh, gatewaypundit.com, which, of course, naturally, uh, since it's conservative, has been banned from Twitter. A Milwaukee County Children's Court judge and former president and CEO of the Cream City Foundation, which runs the city's Drag Queen Story Hour program, has been arrested on seven counts of child pornography. Brett Blom, 38, was arrested on Tuesday for allegedly uploading 27 images and videos of children being sexually abused on the messaging app Kick. Here's a quote. Uh, from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, Referring to Blom and uh, his husband, the couple has two adopted children. No, no, let me come back to that. (sighs) Mm, mm. So again, the alleged pedophile judge was the president and CEO of the Cream City Foundation, which runs the Milwaukee Drag Queen Story Hour program for local children. As of early Thursday morning, however, all articles and mentions of him had been scrubbed from their website. But the links were still cached by Google's search engine, and his role remained detailed on his um, LinkedIn page. Brett Blome is the president and CEO of the Cream City Foundation. He has nearly 15 years of experience in philanthropy, community organizing, law, and nonprofit management. Before joining CCF, Brett served as the director of major gifts uh, for the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin, states his LinkedIn profile. And here's the part that enrages me and, and makes me sick. This is excess charity gone nuts. Blom was held overnight after his arrest and released with a signature. He has been ordered to stay off social media and all file sharing services and is not allowed near any children except the two he adopted with his husband. This is what his defense attorney said. Court records do not suggest that they, the adopted children, are part of any of the illegal images. Oh, okay, so that just makes it okay. He's trustworthy because although he was uploading kitty porn and undoubtedly jacking off to it, he wasn't jacking off to his own children. Child Protective Services is involved with their current placement, defense attorney Christopher Von Wagner said during the court hearing. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, Child Protective Services? His pla- their placement? Their placement with a pedophile, their adoptive father? What the hell is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? This is like when you see abused women who manage to escape a husband who's beating her within an inch of her life, goes to the police station, they document the blood and the bruises and the broken bones, and this poor mother has to go to family court and have a custody fight with the children, and the judge allows her husband to have visitation with the children because he's a good father except for the fact that he beats the living fuck out of his wife. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not going to apologize for the excess swearing and I'm not going to apologize for the anger. This makes me shake with rage. This is a betrayal of children by Child Protective Services and by the family court system. That man should not be allowed near any children and those two children should be taken away from him permanently right now. I know, allegedly, I get it. I'll give you that proviso. If he is found to be innocent, then I will retract everything I just said. But if there's enough evidence to arrest him, there's enough evidence that he is not safe around children. This is a consequence, folks, 
of putting a halo around anybody who calls themselves LGBTQ. It makes me sick. It makes me absolutely sick. We gay men had to fight. Lesbians had to fight. But gay men particularly. <sighs> to change the public's mind who thought that homosexuality itself, particularly gay male homosexuality, was an indication of pedophilia. And this lack of boundaries um, and the fact that the community is just open to anybody who says they're queer, whether or not they're same-sex attracted, whether or not they're giving off all the tells of a predator, this has put us in this situation. The real victims here are the children. My bruised ego and my sense of pride in my community is very much a secondary or a tertiary concern. This is an emergency that is putting children in danger, and it is not only the children in this story, but it is children. Uh, this is not the first time a drag queen story hour has been in the United States has been found to have drag performers who had records for child porn, um, solicitation of a minor. This is not the first case. This is what happens when you have no boundaries. This is inclusion. Happy inclusion to you. Whew. Let's switch gears. <laughs> We're going to have a little fun in the show. There's going to be some more dark, too. There's always more dark. Don't forget that. Um, coming up in the second segment, we have a special guest, as I said, Carrie Smith, the co-host of the Unsafe Space podcast. And what makes Carrie so interesting uh, to me, and and I, I hope to you, is that in many ways she had a similar trajectory politically um, in, in her work experience and with her family that I have. Um, Carrie is also awake to cluster B personality disorders. And um, she awoke to, to what these were and it helped her to see what was wrong with her abusive mother in her family in 20, 2015 or 2016. And at the same time, Carrie had been working in Hollywood in comedy. She worked with some uh, some very well known comedians um, and produced uh, some television shows that you might have seen. And she too began to see that Cluster B is structuring the rules of the social justice left. So join us after the break for an interview with Carrie Smith. Come back. Thanks so much for listening. Would you take just a minute right now and share our show on social media? On Disaffected, we take a close look every week at the abuse dynamics exploding in the dark and disordered world that we live in. Tell other people about us. Welcome back. I'm delighted that we have our first guest on the show. Joining us right now is Carrie Smith. Carrie is in, well, a little bit north of Austin, Texas, I think. And Carrie is co-host of a podcast called unsafe space uh, that she does with Carter Laren. And I started listening to them maybe about three months ago. Um, I heard them on, I heard Carrie actually on one of my favorite podcasts called Trigonometry. And that's what turned me on to their show. So I started listening to Carter and Carrie and my ears pricked up a few weeks ago when I heard Carrie talking about um, the fact that she had some personal family experience with somebody with borderline personality disorder. Um, and I always am sort of attuned to that. But the fact that Carrie also has a, uh, a history, a long history of being in the social justice activism world uh, the way I did, perhaps even longer. Um, and I thought, this is somebody who might know some of the things I'm talking about. So Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Josh. Thanks so much for having me. Your show has become my latest obsession because nobody <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah, I listen to a lot of, obviously a lot of content that, that gets into social justice ideology, my, my old belief system. I love trigonometry also. They do quite a few interviews with people about it, but nobody's doing a show like yours. Nobody's doing a show that's looking at social justice issues through the lens of cluster B. So I'm really excited about your podcast, and uh, and I'm I'm happy that you invited me on. Uh, thanks. We were talking um, sort of offline a couple of days ago, and um, we have some we have some other similarities. Uh, one of the things that I like to do at the end of the day that I find really relaxing after I've done my housework and gotten into uh, my pajamas, I like to sit down and watch plane crash documentaries because I actually find <laughs> that that chills me out. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yes. And I and I heard that you like to watch documentaries about 
cults and sociopaths in order to sort of relax into your evening yeah, jam. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, it's similar. We have different, uh, real <laughs> lately for me, it's cult documentaries. Uh, it's sometimes, yeah, it's, it's about serial killers and sociopaths. And um, there was a time when I was really into horror movies. I'm not as much into those now, but uh, these things that we've watched to unwind, which could be considered pretty dark in some ways it's kind of interesting yeah but it feels like home doesn't it <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> is that what's going on <laughs> i think so yeah, yeah i do <laughs> so um tell people if you please give us a little synopsis of your background i tried to give one but you know yourself better than i do so i guess i would ask you who are you where do you come from and and how did you get uh, to doing what you're doing uh, in your work life now and in your your podcasting life. Sure, I am co-host of Unsafe Space, as you mentioned. We've been doing the show for a, a little over a couple years now, I think. And I started doing it with my friend Carter Laren because I had recently left what I call the cult of social justice. I had been in that cult of belief for over two decades, for about twenty years, and. Um, my process of leaving it was slow and, and drawn out, much like the process of getting into it, I think, is, is tends to be a gradual one. And I'd started talking more about it and, and criticizing it online a little more. And in the course of doing that, I lost a lot of friends, of course. I lost a lot of people in the social justice belief system. But then I also had people like Carter people I knew who had previously only been acquaintances reach out and want to find out what was going on with me, who were interested in, in what I was saying and, and agreed with some of it. And Carter was one of those people. And he's since become one of my best friends. And we started doing the show together. Um, one of the series we started is, is called Deprogrammed. And Deprogrammed is specifically focused around my old belief system. It's it's a deep dive into social justice ideology. We do a lot of interviews in that series. So we've interviewed um, Brett Weinstein. Oh, I'm sorry about the dogs. Should I pause? No, no, okay. it, it's fine. That's okay. um. Uh, yeah. This is Tiger, right? Yeah, but there's three other dogs here today. Um, <clears throat> there happens to be a person walking by with a dog, so they should stop in a second. They're just letting me know that I should be on the lookout. Uh, okay, I think we're good, hopefully. So <clears throat> where, was I, where was I? So Deprogrammed is more of a deep dive into social justice ideology. And we do a lot of long form interviews in that series. We've been able to interview Brett Weinstein, James Lindsay, Helen Pluckrose. And we, we've actually started talking a lot more about social justice in our, our other show as well, which is maybe the one you've seen, The Cafefe Break which is our live show on Monday and Friday. That show is, is, is meant to be more of just a discussion of, of culture and what's going on in the news. It, it's just that social justice ideology kind of went mainstream last year. So now we find that we're talking about it a lot in that show as well. I, I Yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 is there anything that it hasn't seeped into, right? Right. Um, and I, get, I, wonder if it's, I wonder if it's more interesting to talk about how you got into it or how you got out of it. Um, and I'll throw th I'll throw a few things out there and, and you can sort of take these and respond to them in the way that you think is right. But I notice, you know, this show is mainly about cluster B personality disorders, um, the kinds of, of character traits and character disorders that make up the psychological makeup of abusive parents, abusive spouses, um, manipulative bosses, narcissistic and grasping politicians. And for me, um, I noticed a connection between the fact that when I was in the social justice world, when I was part of what was called the new atheist community, before that, uh, when I was much younger, I was very active in, in uh, uh, the gay rights movement which had a social justice component, but I think that, that back then during the late 80s and early 90s, um, we were much more focused on actual tangible legal harms. You know, we were, we were asking for things that were, uh, that were reasonable, you know, actual equal rights under the law. And, and we're in a different world now. 
uh, and what's called social justice these days uh, looks a lot more to me like collective narcissism, a cult of narcissism. And I when I had my awakening, as I call it, to what personality disorders were, when that finally explained why my deranged mother was as abusive as she was, I found myself at the same time uh, seeing that behavior and seeing those character traits in my friends and my compatriots, if you will. Was it like that for you or was it different? It was like that for me. And we, you and I talked about this a little bit offline a lot of times when I do interviews, people will want to ask me about, you know, what woke you up? What what helped you get out of this particular ideology that you've been entrenched in for so long? And there's a lot of different conversations you can have there. And usually we talk about the, the actual things that, that penetrated my worldview. And one of those was going down a a rabbit hole of watching videos on online of, of Trump supporters being physically attacked by people who were supposedly on my side. And that was really emotional for me to watch those videos. And that was one of the first things that made me question if I actually, if the narrative I believed in was true, because the narrative I believed in was that Trump supporters were the violent people. And so that's usually the conversation that that I have, or that people want to talk about. Um, sometimes people. Let me let me ask you. How about how about what got you into it? Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, uh, that's that's also. I think I could. You could have several conversations about what got me into it and what got me out of it. Um, because it, let me just finish this thought before I lose this one, if you don't mind. One of the other conversations I've had about getting out of it was it has been, and I've only had this one maybe once with Benjamin Boyce, and that was more about you know God finding God and and becoming a Christian around the same time, roughly around the same time that I started questioning this ideology, and so I've had that conversation before, but I've never had the conversation with someone in an interview about cluster B personality disorders and having an awakening to what those are. So, um, so so. So that's sort of, I'm excited about having that with you. I'm a little nervous about it, I'll be honest, but I'm happy happy to talk about it. And and then, yeah, so getting into it, I, I would say it's the same thing. There's three different conversations you could have. And one of those probably, if we're going to talk about the cluster B thing, probably has to, has to be that I grew up in a chaotic home. Uh, I grew up in a home that led me to distrust authority and tradition, I guess. And I also uh, had, I was raised in a Southern Baptist home and I, I left that belief system. And I think that, I think that social justice ideology functions for some people like a religion. They put it in, I know you're an atheist, but I'll, I, I think you'll let me talk about the, what I consider to be the God hole, the place that where God should go or could go is people will put other things in that place, things that they worship instead. And this definitely functioned as a religion for me. It filled that vacuum and it was, it gave me a, uh, uh, like a blueprint for how to be a good person in the world and how to go out and try to, you know, you're trying to make the world a better place. You're trying to end racism and sexism. You're on the side of the good people. Here are some rules to follow. And then those rules, they keep evolving and they keep adding new ones and they keep getting you to buy into more of it. So um, it definitely did that. It did that for me. Uh, I'm not sure if, do you have a specific question about cluster B and getting into it? Cause I'm, I'm probably searching around yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, there's a lot of ways to get into it. Um, I'll, I'll I'll throw out what I think my connection was, and you can just riff off that. It, it, you okay. may say, hey, yeah, it was the same for me, or no, it wasn't, and it was like this. Okay. Um, I have a suspicion that for people like us, you know, I mean, as, as people who watch my show know, my mother has borderline and narcissistic personality disorders, and we'll get into, um, you know, your assessment of cluster B in your family. I always felt, from a very young age, I always had a strong sense of... Um, of the requirement for justice, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things I was very reactive to, and I'm still very reactive to, is the concept of unfairness. I, I think I grew up in a household where unfairness and injustice in the home was, was one of the overriding things that made it the home we lived in. Um, 
you know, the unfairness, the emotional expectations, the chaotic, um, ever-changing rules from my mercurial mother. And I suspect that for me, social justice and political activism on behalf of groups of people who either were oppressed or who I perceived to be oppressed seemed like a natural a natural place for my own psychology to go. What about you? I think you're right. Uh, unfairness, some things being unjust, it's definitely a soft spot for me. And, you know, if I feel that someone is, if I think someone's being treated unfairly, uh, especially if it's a friend or someone I love, it, it's, uh, I have that characteristic of, of sometimes rushing in impulsively even to try and defend them. And so I do think social justice appealed to me because it was here, you, you need to fight on behalf of the oppressed and the underdog. Here's an ideology that set, has justice in the name. And it's about right. fighting it, for, for those who, uh, who who society is treating unfairly. And it sells itself that way very, very successfully. So yeah, yeah I yeah, would agree does. with you about that. So, Tell me about home. Yeah. I know this is the first time you're having this conversation and you can, you know, you can have it any way you want to have it. Um, but yeah, what, <laughs> what's cluster B in, in Carrie Smith's home like, or what was it like? So my mother and I, ha and I haven't talked about this and, and you're right. Whenever it comes up on the show, I've always tended just to say, well, if we do talk about it, well, someone in my family, uh, I think has BPD and not really go into specifics. And I do have a lot of trepidation about, about being more specific, but, uh, I also think it's important. I like what you're doing with the show about just being honest about these kind of personality disorders and how they affect people. And, and, and I do think a lot of us have interacted with someone who has one of these personality disorders. Anyway, uh, my mother, is someone who, what I most often describe if I'm talking to a, someone in my life and trying to explain it, I'll just say she, she was physically and emotionally, emotionally abusive. I usually don't get more specific than that unless it's someone like you who uh, knows about borderline and knows about some of the cluster B disorders. But uh, our life was, we grew up in a middle-class home we had parents with, you know, who went to college and had good jobs and they definitely provided us with a lot of privileges in, in terms of, uh, access to things that you, that you can, you can have in a middle-class home. I had good education. Um, not at the, not at the school I went to originally, but I ended up getting into a science and math high school, a boarding high school, um, that's state funded and you go and live there. And I took the first opportunity I could to get out of the house. So I moved out of the house at 15 to go, uh, to that school. And, um, they definitely provided for me to go to a, a, an expensive college, you know, took out a lot of stu student loans as well, but they shouldered a lot of the burden for me to be there. And so they provided in a lot of those ways. And, and yet when we were kids, my brother and sister and I often couldn't figure out what was wrong with our family. And were all families like this because we had a outward facing public persona and the image that my mom tried to cultivate of, of what we were and that we all knew th there were rules about what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say to other people. There's even rules about, I'm sure you know this, about having people over uh, because oh, yeah. you, you can't, you can't <clears throat> excuse me, you can't do or say anything to challenge that, that uh, perception that is being put out there. Facebook these days for my mom, I think functions a lot like church functioned when we were kids. It's like the outward perception of the perfect family. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> the mask, yeah. The, the mask of the narcissist. Yeah. But um, yeah, so our, our home life was very chaotic and that, that was because uh, our, our mother was emotionally and, and physically abusive and emotionally chaotic herself. And it was hard to understand, A, is what's happening to us abuse or not? Even 
when if you something that you were if I were to describe it to someone who wasn't abused, they would say, yes, that's absolutely abuse. Uh, you know, being hit with belts, um, the buckle into the belt, even with toilet plungers, metal bars, coat hangers, whatever was around. It was like, here's an implement. Right. Um, the, but and then the psychological and emotional abuse was um, was worse than that in a lot of ways because it was it was coming from a parent and you're on somebody the one who, hand somebody who says they they love you and somebody that you have to believe loves you your mother yes although I don't recall her saying that but <laughs> oh are you saying that your your mother was not somebody who said I love you. No. <laughs> um, of course, you believe that your parents do, but I don't recall that being said. Um, and anyway, a lot of times when we saw abused children in, in pop culture, like in movies or in books, the the abuse would be, you know, from uh, it would be a poor family. There'd be alcoholism problems or something. There would be, you know, it, it didn't fit with the rest of our life. My mom didn't have any substance abuse problems. Um, our, our family wasn't poor. And so sometimes we would even ask my 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 siblings, you know, are we being abused like that sort of I can't I can't I don't really know. And you're not really sh you're not really sure what to believe and and who to believe, and um, so anyway, I I dealt with this and my siblings dealt with it all in our our own ways and developed our own coping mechanisms and um, got out of the house as, as soon as we could and um, in adulthood I started to think that she had some form of narcissism and even as a kid we would try to figure out what it was. I mean, I remember going to the library and checking out books of, of you know, it, maybe it's borderline, you know, trying to not borderline, sorry, maybe it's bipolar, bipolar, um, which was a word I had heard uh, as a kid. Uh, but it wasn't until I was an adult in my thirties and I was home visiting and I had just had one of these just chaotic, um, encounters with my mom and, at that time, I thought it was enough just to not fight back with her. And so I was still making mistakes that I later learned were mistakes, like sticking around when the hurricane started instead of leaving. And anyway, I went out, I went out to uh, lunch with a friend of mine who I'd grown up with and who's now uh, had just become at the time a therapist. And that friend, we were discussing it and she said, you know what? Your mom is borderline. And I had never heard that word before. And, and then, she, and then she shared with me some of her memories of my mother from when we were kids, some of her own memories and just how terrified she was being in the car with my mom on a particular trip and how everyone what was happened terrified. During and that she trip? What'd you say? What happened? I, 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 yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, mm -hmm. um, are there any anecdotes that you remember that you're that you're they're willing to talk about? And I'm not asking that specifically to put you on the spot, and I'm not asking that in a lurid way. Right. Um, it. I'm asking it because my approach to this has been. Um, I found that actually telling the stories of what happened, the words that were said, or or you know, what set the temper tantrum off, what the reaction was, that actually narrating those for people has a, a way of, I mean, every time I've done so, I hear from people who say, oh my God, I thought I was the only one who had a father who did that. Right. Or um, that, you know, that sounds, that sounds like something my mother would say almost verbatim. Um, I'm wondering if you could give an example of, of, of one of those hurricanes, right? Like wh what it was about, yeah. what was said, what was going on? Yes, so they most often started between her and my father, but sometimes they would start between her and one of us. And it could be anything. It could be the most innocuous thing. Um, 
you know, recently as an adult, it, it, here's just a silly example. You know, if you're sitting at the table and you compliment, you know, if, if my dad made the beans and you're like, oh, the beans are really good, dad. And she's like, oh, the beans are really good, dad. Like this kind of just wickedness and this uh, mocking language that is meant to tell you you did something wrong by complimenting him and not her. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes those things would just then escalate because someone would push back. And there were a lot of fights between her and my dad that started over nothing, innocuous things, and then escalated into screaming matches where, I mean, she her favorite word for him was shit ass. Uh, you know, you fucking shit ass and this and um, I hate you. Uh, j- just but loud screaming. It's hard to explain with that just chaotic uh fighting is like and sometimes he would fight back and then and then it would get physical from time to time i mean she would throw things at him glass bottles of juice um she would hit him she once she cut him with a pair of scissors i found him in the living room when i woke up one night and he was in the living room crying and his hand was bleeding and she had stabbed him with the scissors um she uh Sometimes when the, if the fights escalated, she would, she would drag us kids into it. I mean, we would be sleeping sometimes and you would wake up with a bang, bang, bang on the door, or she would just bust through the door and wake you up and pull you out of bed and, you know, carry your dad, dad is this, that, that, you know, in the middle of the night, <laughs> um, yeah. dragging your siblings into it. Um, she would try to turn us on each other. Like, she would accuse my dad of not being man enough to spank us um, to, you know, she would tell him to get up from yes. the table and take his belt off and whip us. Um, she would he do it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes he did. And uh, a lot of times, sometimes he would stand up to her and sometimes he wouldn't. And if he didn't stand up to her, I mean, if he did stand up to her, it was worse. Um, she called the cops on him and had him thrown into jail overnight because they're more inclined to believe that it's the man who's abusing the woman. She had, she kept a file of uh, pictures of bruises and, and things that she could use against him if he ever tried to file for divorce. And some of these were photos of just bruises she got by bumping her leg. I mean, they weren't all as a result of fights with him. It's just, if, if she got a bruise, there's an opportunity to take a picture of it. Um, she, uh, there, there was once that one time that I told a teacher, uh, we had a, I had a, a seventh grade teacher who asked me about bruises on my legs and I told her scared to death, <laughs> but I, I told her yeah. about my mom and I didn't hear anything about it for a couple of days. And then my mother w- waited. She, she apparently called my mom. My mom was a teacher too. And, um, uh, at a different school, but you know, she knew she was a teacher and she called my mother. Anyway, my mother saved that knowledge until it was most hurtful to reveal it. And, 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 and some type of argument was like, you know, even I won't say that teacher's name, let's say, let's say Miss Jones, even Miss Jones doesn't believe you. And it was like, Oh, that's how I found out that the teacher went to my mom. <laughs> um, so then I never told it's, anyone it's so wicked. Uh, again until uh, I told a, my, my siblings and I told a youth pastor and that was a big mistake because the youth pastor told the pastor who then brought us in for family counseling. And my mom was so livid and just sitting in that, that counseling session with the, the whole family and with the preacher was the most excruciating thing. It's like, he, I, th- I think he was terrified of her. <laughs> I'm like, what have yeah. you done? You know, the, the, the betrayal to get that required to get her, to get the family to have to come in, to the preacher and sit down. We never went back to that church again. That's when we quit going to church as a family. Of course. Um, and, uh, over the years we had occasionally friends, like the friend who ended up being a therapist and gave me the word borderline. Um, she, she said the first night that she, that her mom met my mother, 
was at a band thing. We were in the, in the band together and that her, her mom came home and said, there's something wrong with that woman. Like some, some parents could see it. And then, uh, there were some parents who stopped letting their kids come to our house on the occasions we were allowed to have friends over something sometimes would happen. The longer that people were around her, the harder it was for her to keep the mask on. So yes, uh, that yes. didn't come off. And then those people were, weren't allowed over anymore because they had seen it. And, um, anyway, oh, another, the, another thing she liked to do is she, she, she vacillated between mood very quickly like you said these emotional these different states of emotion and it's like zero to 60 right away yeah so there would be right away um always she yeah it would be uh, you know just seething rage and physical abuse and uh, lashing out and attacking us physically and then she would switch to despondent sobbing and weeping in her bedroom about how she's going to kill herself and nobody loves her and nobody values her. And we would have to go in. A lot of times our dad would send us in. He would say one of you, like Carrie, you go in or one of my, you know, you go in and talk to her. And I, it got to the point where, um, the suicide threats were so over the top and, and happen so often. And they, and that they, you just kind of become inured to them. And I remember yeah. there was one Christmas where she was out, um, on the diving board, we had a in-ground pool and it was frozen over and covered, you know, but she was out on the diving board in her pajamas, like not, not wearing enough. It was, it was very cold out there. She was in her pajamas and she was on the diving board crying and wailing and pitching a fit laying on the diving board about how she was going to jump into the freezing pool and kill herself. And we're just standing because it was always worse at the holidays, the Christmas stuff like that. It would really get ratcheted up. And we're I'm just sorry, standing, I'm laughing. I know, but see, you can laugh at stuff like this. this is, <laughs> some people, when you, I tell these stories, they don't, they don't have the sense of humor about it. And I, I really love it. It's just so to, ridiculous. <laughs> We were just standing in the kitchen looking at her, and I remember we were all kind of looking at each other like, okay, he was going to go out and talk to her. Like, it's just sort of like. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, I mean, what, what what was it? Was she going to kill herself because what was it about getting in the pool that was going to kill her? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... <laughs> they didn't have to make sense, you know? We no. Had... Yeah, we had, um, you know, she's pulled a gun on my dad before, um, which, and I pulled a gun on my dad once, uh, which is, you know, behavior I saw modeled by her. And yep. we, we just had a lot of issues coming out of that household. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Things were a little bit rocky. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting. I'm going. Trying to go back to vague language now. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. I want to draw. I want to draw a couple it, connections. Go ahead. Finish. Oh no, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, I just want to. Um, and and for those of you who are watching who maybe haven't, um, don't don't have not had this experience and i hope that that's most of you but i i also know that a lot of people watching this show who are going to be attracted to a show like this are sadly going to have experiences like you and i have had carrie and i just and i want i want to say thank you um uh for being willing to talk about this with me especially because i know that this is the first time that you've talked about it in any detail and i know i know the kind of risk that it feels like you're taking and I'm honored that you would would do it with me. We don't even know each other, um, but there is something that children of borderline mothers um, and and cluster B parents generally we tend, I think, we sniff each other out. It's almost subconscious. Sometimes it's on a, a level of intuition. But I had that feeling about you when I started listening to your show. It was no surprise to me when I heard you say. My um, that somebody in my family has borderline personality disorder, and I pretty much figured it would be your mother, and it was. But I I wanna I wanna point out for people who are watching and listening a few things that Carrie said, um, and weave a few threads together for you. The the turning on a dime, the emotional turning on a dime, is very um, is really classic to borderline personality disorder, um, and this is uh, as is the idea. That, well, 
maybe she has bipolar, which which you mentioned, Carrie. Um, I most of the time anymore, when I hear somebody say that somebody has bipolar, I provisionally assume I'm I'm willing to be wrong, and I have been wrong. Um, but I'm usually right about this. I provisionally assume that person does not have bipolar disorder, which is what we call manic depression, same thing, but they have borderline personality disorder. Why do I assume that? Because people have, um, people are miseducated about what these disorders are. They are not at all in the same family. Um, bipolar or manic depression, generally speaking, um, and there are exceptions to this. So, uh, yes, yes, viewers, I do understand that there's something called rapid cycling bipolar. But generally speaking, the depressive, despairing episodes and the manic highs tend to happen over the course of a couple of weeks. And then there's a change that lasts another couple of weeks. And then there's a change back. The flipping happens over the period of days or weeks. With a borderline, it can happen literally within seconds. Uh, like like what Carrie said, I my mother has done the same thing, screaming almost demonic rage, spit flying out of her mouth, and two minutes later, she could be sitting on the floor with her head in her hands, um, crying so so hard that she can't get her breath and saying, "I have nothing to live for." Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that would that would then turn into hysterical laughter as if this were all funny. And Carrie, you and I talked the other day about the fact that both of us as children read Christina Crawford's book, Mommy Dearest. You sent me a paperback. You sent me a, um, a photograph of, of, of a war-torn paperback. Um, <laughs> yes. And I, I want to connect for people what Carrie just described of her mother banging on the door of the bedroom in the middle of the night and pulling the children out. My mother did this, too. Um, uh, in my case, uh, it was usually... Um, of course, it had nothing to do with, with, with what she actually claimed. These were demons that lived inside my mother that had nothing to do with her. But for me, it was usually I had not completed a chore correctly. I'd left yeah. spots on the dishes um, or I vacuumed the floor wrong. And vacuuming the floor wrong could sometimes mean that I did not pull the vacuum cleaner in straight lines so that uh, the nap of the carpet was messy instead of smooth. I mean, this kind of stuff could send my mother into a rage. Christina Crawford called this she called these night raids, and I, I like that term, and I've adopted it myself. These are night raids, and the terror of being pulled out of your bedroom in the middle of the night. Um, I don't know about you, Carrie, but I, I mean, I had insomnia for years uh, and couldn't tolerate I couldn't tolerate the sound of so even when I was as an adult when I was living with other people of my choice. I would have almost a panic reaction if I were falling asleep and I could hear footsteps coming up the hallway. Yeah. Did you anticipate this? I mean, were they were they out of the blue? I, I suspect you know what that feels like. I do. They they were out of the blue. I got to where I would lock my door, which we weren't allowed to do, and uh, she broke the lock on the door. Uh, the. I didn't have, I don't recall having problems with night terrors or not being able to sleep, but I also started drinking at, in my twenties. And so usually I didn't have a problem falling asleep because I think I, I think I used alcohol back then to cope and to, to be able to turn my head off and to be able to pass out essentially. Um, I'm sober now almost a year and a half or year and five Congratulations. months. Yeah. And, uh, I don't have trouble falling asleep now. What I did have for a long time were, uh, nightmares in, uh, and where I would end up screaming or talking in my sleep. And when I was at the science of math school, for example, we had roommates and, uh, they would laugh because I, I was at that time I was still, when I first started going there, I was still, a a, a believer and I, I, I didn't curse. They thought I, w I was cute because I didn't curse. But in my dreams, I would, in my nightmares, and a lot of my nightmares had to do with, um, you know, I would be uh, flying and, and having this sort of sense of euphoria and and running and running and running until I could fly and flying. And then my and then I would be pulled down and, and it would be my mom hanging on my legs and pulling me back down to earth. Or I would be, and I, I would 
be swimming and she, uh, someone, something, some pressure would come from above and start drowning me. And it would be my mom. Um, I had a lot of nightmares where almost every night, you know, at some point I would be like, get the F off of me. And I would be cursing myself. But in the daytime, I wouldn't curse. But in my dreams, I'm like, get the F off of me, you know, screaming back. Yeah. And so that was, that was something I, 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 uh, almost punched my ex-husband in, in my sleep once, like rolled over and cause I was having a fight with her in my dream. And, uh, yeah, so it did affect, it did affect my dreams in that way, I guess, um, my sleeping, but now I don't, I don't have as many of those dreams anymore, which I think is a good sign. Me neither. Occasionally I will. Um, I, I do have a, every once in a while I have a nightmare about uh, I started journaling. I like to write, you know, when I was younger, I, I journaled quite a bit. And a lot of my journals from like high school and college, uh, they got a qu- quite a bit maudlin. A lot of them were about her and a sort of woe is me and, and just like dealing with the, my sadness about what she wasn't and these sort of longing kind of posts about what I wish my mom was. And, um, you know, bad poetry about her and stuff. And, and, uh, when I was in college, uh, I had about six of those journals that I had left at, at my, at my parents' house and they were locked in my filing cabinet underneath the files. And I was living that summer. It was the summer. Uh, let's see. It was after my first year of college. I was living that summer at a friend's place and, I got a call from them, from my parents at night, and my dad was enraged. My mother was on the phone, hysterical, because I guess she didn't want him to tell me, but she basically gone through my whole room, had broken into my filing cabinet, had found them hidden beneath the files, and had spent who knows how long reading all of my innermost thoughts, most of which were about her, um, and and then had told my dad some of the things and then, you know, that made him the choice things that would make him very angry. Um, you know, what a violation. <laughs> yeah. What a yeah, violation had, that bothered me for so long. I quit journaling for years. I couldn't, I couldn't go back and read them because I, I, I still can't really, I can't read the old ones. I've started journaling again, but I can't read the old ones because I can't read them without the lens of my mother re- being there reading them. And, um, and yeah, that was a complete, uh, a, a complete violation. And, and, and I still have nightmares sometimes about having to hide my journals and, or someone finding them like these sort of anxiety things about my innermost feelings about her being out in the open. This is, this interview really terrifies me <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but in a way it feels like, you know, I just don't want her. I mean, I'm sure she will at some point probably see it, uh, but uh, there's yeah. like the sense of power that's given up just to even let her know how much she hurt me. Do you know? And yes, uh, you know, someone reading all my thoughts is is, is such a theft. And um, so that that was a, yes, a big uh, a big turning point for me in 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 a lot of ways with my parents and. Uh, oh, but let me tell you one funny thing. You'll appreciate this. So the things that she had told my dad about that were in the journals were things I had been, you know, experimenting with in college, um, social justice, no, okay. <laughs> but that was in there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I had experimented with some drugs that was in there. And so my dad's like, are you a drug addict? Are you, you know, you're, do- you're trying drugs. Um, and another was that I had had, uh, I'd had a sexual experience with a woman that I didn't like. I wrote about it that I didn't like it and it wasn't for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> no, do you need do you want to take the left over? No, I couldn't possibly. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm done. But uh he was so upset and was like, you know, are you a lesbian? And uh so this is kind of funny. They they actually called um they said they wouldn't they wouldn't my dad didn't want to send me back to to help pay for my college any, anymore. He probably, they probably shouldn't have paid for that expensive education. There's, I have a lot of thoughts about that now, but, uh, but he, he didn't want to send me back the next year unless I agreed to go to 
counseling. And so they called, um, they arranged for me to go to counseling at Duke my sophomore year. And he went with me to the first session and you'll find the story fine. It's just a side note story. We show up for the therapy session and my therapist is an obvious dyke. And she's, very, <laughs> she, she has, if it weren't obvious by her appearance, she has rainbow flags everywhere decorated in the office. There's like, uh, just it's, it's obvious, but my dad did, yep. did, doesn't, didn't, wasn't, in an area where you would pick up on those things. And so he had no idea. So we sit down and she's, she says, you know, why are you here today? And he says, you, you know, Carrie's just uh, getting off the, getting off the tracks. You know, she's trying drugs. I think she's a, I think she's a lesbian. And, <laughs> and so <laughs> she talked to him for a while and then she asked him to leave. And, and, and then she said to me, you know, so let's talk about your parents. And, uh, and then that was funny because they would call periodically and make sure I was still going to see my lesbian counselor so I didn't become a lesbian. But uh, that was kind of funny. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F-E-C- T E D. Thank you. They're da- they 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 are dangerous. All cluster bees are dangerous. Um, some of them are physically violent. Some of them are not. But all of them are dangerous. And even if they're not physically dangerous, they are emotionally dangerous, or they are dangerous because they we. They will, I mean, you know, look at the things your mother did, you know, the the keeping of the pictures of bruises that didn't even come from what she said they came from so that she could use them to create a false story about your father or about somebody else in your family that, you know, but there are some people who are even more extremely dangerous. And if you get yourself into the sights of a sociopath, a straight up sociopath or a narcissistic uh, sociopath, uh, some people call that malignant narcissist. You know, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, these are the people that sometimes will dog a person for years, you know, make a person their target and weave elaborate schemes against them. Um, so it's, you know, I, it for that reason alone, I suggest to people that, you know, even if you've got somebody in your life or somebody who's in your family who fits this profile, be careful. Be, in fact, be more careful than you think you need to be. Don't give them the free pass because it's my sister or it's my brother. That's not going to stop them. They only know how to hurt you more effectively. They've already done their homework on you. Yeah. And 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 also in my experience, they will fish for information and try to get – when they're in that phase of, of building you up, they'll try to get anything they can um, – to pull things out of you. They'll try to get you to talk negatively about other people so that they have these things to hold over your head to keep you close to them. And then if you decide yeah. once you see them for what they are and you don't want to be close to them, um, if they have any of those things that they've managed to pull out of you, they'll openly threaten you. Like, you know, how, how would you like it if I spilled these secrets about blah, blah, blah? And it's like, wow, that's who does that? That's a crazy behavior. And, you know, in my case, thankfully, uh, the one person I'm, I'm thinking of when I'm talking about this didn't have anything to hold over my head, wasn't able to pull things out of me, though, though she right. tried. Um, but then they'll just like create fiction. It doesn't matter. They'll just create fiction. And it's sort of like, when a normal person hears something uh, like an accusation, they'll think it must be grounded in something, even if it's misconstrued. It must be grounded in something. <laughs> right. Yeah, where's that yeah. coming from? How could she possibly say this? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> there's no evidence for that because yeah. there's no way it could be misconstrued. It's just a bald-faced lie. That And that is the di- that is something that people like you, Carrie, and people like me know because we know Cluster B and even before we knew what it was called and before we knew that there was actually a population that fit into this intellectual framework, we knew that these people existed because we grew up with them. And many people and some of you watching and listening, uh, thank you to those of you who are watching and listening, all of you. Uh, But I'm speaking now to those of you who have not had a cluster B in your lives. You tend to think 
that everybody, all humans are essentially good or essentially stable and, and that all humans, when it comes right down to it, really do mean well. It's just that some of them make a mistake in how to get there. You are in danger if you believe that. That is a false belief. And you are in danger. I'm not... Most people are not personality disordered, thank goodness. But this is not just a few people. Although it's a minority, it's not just 1%. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't believe the official estimates um, uh, in the medical literature. I do not believe for one second that, that only 2% of the population has borderline personality disorder. I do not believe for one second that only 1% is narcissistic and only 1% is sociopathic. I don't believe it. I don't believe that but anymore how, either. So I, that's right? interesting because I came to this conclusion um, this past year where I, I said, you know, I used to think it was a very small minority of the population, <laughs> but I, I don't, I, I certainly don't think it's most people, but, I, but I think, no, it isn't. Like I said, we've all met someone who has one of these personality disorders. There's, there's more of them than I used to think, I guess, put it that way. And, and I think I think they've they've gotten they you know I think we are actually growing more of them. Well, that's interesting. That's what I want you know uh, uh, wanted to talk to you about was was how you kind of tie this into social justice ideology. And I saw a tweet of yours. I saw it today. I don't know if you tweeted it today, but you said something about how um, when you talk about social justice ideology being being uh, like a collective personality disorder, you don't mean as an analogy. You mean Actually, there are people. I mean it literally. Literally, there are people with personality disorders who 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 get into this cult of belief, and yes, I think that's interesting because most often when I've when I've made the analogy, it, it's been more of like, you know, I, I've said it as a, it's as if it's a collective kind of borderline personality disorder, but I'm starting to agree with you. I do think there's a lot of BPD, BPD people in it who get drawn to it. Yeah. I think so too. I well, and I think part of it is is selection, right? It's self selection. So, um, there are certain areas of life and certain social circles that that tend to be places where a borderline or a narcissist can make a good social living, and 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 social justice is the place where they can make the best social living. So, I think that we should expect that cluster bees are self selecting themselves into the social justice world. Um, so, you know, that could make it appear to that there are more of them at large than there really are. Yeah. Um, but but, you know, I've thought about this more broadly and I, you know, I've talked to my therapist about this, too. And, and in fact, a few shows ago, I pulled a few statistics out. There's not a lot, but the literature that is out there does show um, that there has been a rise in people is. Um, meeting the, the criteria for borderline narcissistic and histrionic personality disorder. And it's happened over the past couple of generations. Um, and it coincides many people, even if you haven't heard of that, people have heard of the studies, the recent studies in the past 10 years that have shown an alarming drop in the level of empathy in U.S. college students. Lack of empathy is 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 about cluster B, right? It doesn't mean that everybody who has an empathy problem is is a cluster B, but lacking empathy, lacking a conscience, or lacking fully functional empathy is one of the core characteristics of these personality disorders. Um, yeah. So, you know, I I think that we're seeing them more. I think that they're having a day right now. They're having a day in the sun because social justice has become mainstream. But I also think that in the latter half of the twentieth century. Um, that yes, uh, a combination of our culture and and frankly very poor parenting, not even outright abusive parenting, but just very poor parenting, has, has probably had something to do with that. I think so too, because I think some of it maybe comes from not having stable, loving relationships at a young age with your parents. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, a lot of people with. Uh, According to what I've read in, in Understanding the Borderline Mother and other books is uh, if you have a borderline parent, it's very likely you're going to have some characteristics of borderline. And, you know, I don't know. It's yep. kind of a repeating thing. Uh, I just wanted to mention something before I forget it. So so just anecdotally, the number of people I know who are in social justice who admit to being borderline and almost wear it as a badge of honor 
and pride because it shows that they're marginalized, right? That's growing. And there's a, a picture I sent you of an old friend of mine who has, it was sort of when I started waking up and leaving social justice ideology was around the time that she really doubled down and went way deep into it. And she has what you told me are the, the borderline glasses, the, uh, <laughs> the, the SJW glasses. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's got one of the different styles of SJW hair in her case, it's the multicolored mm -hmm. hair, but, um, she, she takes a lot of pictures of herself wearing, she's a white woman. She takes a lot of pictures of herself wearing these, um, angry with this angry look on her face, glaring defiantly in the camera with a t-shirt that says like this one says F around and find out this one says white silence is violence. Um, you know, this one says black lives yeah. still effing matter. Um, it's just, it's just a lot oh, of, yeah. uh, here's one that says a t-shirt says blue lives murder. And she's just glaring at the camera. Um, in between her posts, oh, yeah, they're full of rage. She's full of rage. And in between her posts, though, about social justice issues, which are full of rage, then there's these really despondent posts that's kind of they're kind of like, woe is me, where she goes into long uh, explanation of what borderline is like. And she especially during borderline awareness month, which is a thing. I don't know if you celebrated, but it was. Oh, stop. <laughs> Kevin, get cut this woman off. <laughs> <laughs> but during borderline awareness month, she'll post these long things of just and and it's like uh, it's it's not some borderline awareness month. Hasn't it been borderline awareness month for about six fucking years already? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they don't. What they're doing during borderline awareness month, they're not actually helping people. And social justice doesn't help people get out of mental health issues. It doesn't help people with borderline. It validates that. It validates, it validates their issues. It. it tells them to stay in it because, hey, this is your yeah. oppressed identity and you get social this currency is you. This by is being your oppressed in this way. Yeah. Uh, and so all of her posts are sort of uh, written from the tone of voice of, this is what it's like to be borderline. You, you should thank God you're not afflicted like me. Poor me. I have this this disorder, this mental health disorder, and this is how society should change to uh, cater to me and to my borderline issues. That's how it's written. Oh yeah, it, yeah. It's 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 absolutely classic. And and the thing is, I mean, this you know, um, I would say, you know, we are all afflicted by these people. Right. They do suffer. They absolutely do suffer. But that doesn't excuse the suffering they give to us. Um, and and I think that that's one of the things you learn when you when you put up those boundaries and and those barriers. Um, Carrie, you have given us a lot of your time and you have um, you've shared things that that I know that you haven't talked about in detail before. Um, and I I want to say again Thank you. I'm I'm honored that you chose to do that, um, and I I want to uh, let you go so that you can in, uh, attend to Tiger and get your d dinner ready and stuff. And I was trying to figure out uh, how to close this interview out, and I thought um, just like a really fast uh, round of yes or no questions. Are you game for it? I'm just trying out an experiment. I'm game for it. Okay. All right. So here we go. <clears throat> These are just yes or no questions. Think of it like a verbal Rorschach test. Whatever comes to your mind first, just give an answer. Number one, mayonnaise or mustard? Mustard. Wrong. <laughs> Number two. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, I see how this is going to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. Benson and Hedges or Marlboro? Marlboro. Okay, that's correct. I would also have accepted both and bring us a wine list. <clears throat> Question three, winter or summer? Winter. Correct. Number four, Betty Davis or Joan Crawford? Oh, Betty Davis. <laughs> I'm going to have you back. I'm going to do a deep dive on Joan Crawford and we'll watch some Mommy Dearest. Um, I'm going to see if uh, our schedules can can match up because I think you'd have good fun um, coming on with that. Yeah. The last one is I want to uh, promo your show. Where can listeners find Unsafe Space with you and Carter Laren? 
Um, and where and when can they find the live chats that you guys do when you do the show? Yeah, we are at unsafespace.com and you can find us on YouTube under Unsafe Space and anywhere that you listen to podcasts, iTunes, wherever, Unsafe Space. Uh, We have a book club coming up. We read a book a month. We alternate between fiction and nonfiction and it's free to join and be a part of the live discussion. Um, You can find out about the the current book this month if you go to unsafespace.com, the book club page. And our live videos are every Monday and Friday at one o'clock Texas time. I'm going to try to jo- uh, join you for some of those. Uh, I haven't yet, but when I listen to you talk and I hear you reading the super chats, I'm like, I need to know all these people. They sound, they all sound like good fun. We have good fun people in the chat. That's for sure. <laughs> awesome. And we want to have you Carrie, on the show. Thank- we'll figure that out, but I would love to have you. Okay. On. Uh, anytime I can be helpful, be happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to talk again and I wish you well, Carrie. Okay. Thank you, Josh. I also, one last thing. I, I, I do have you have me back because I want to just sit and dish with you with the dark humor that only kids of BPD moms can have at some point. <laughs> oh, uh, we can definitely do that. Yeah, we can cool. definitely do that. All right. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Want to talk back to us? You're in luck. Call our listener line and leave us a message. 202-979-2480. That's 202-979-2480. And remember, we do reserve the right to play messages on the air. Hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F. E-C-T-E-D. Thank you.